Call the meeting of the City Commission for Thursday, January 19th in Commission Chambers at the Municipal and Safety Building open. And uh, first thing, we will have our prayer and our pledge. And tonight, Pastor Donald Mushimunda from First Christian Church is coming forward for that. And then we will uh, stand for that and continue standing for the pledge. Shall we pray? Father, tonight we want to honor you once more. We thank you because you, you love us. You love the world. You created man in your own image. You imbued man with your spirit. Men are living beings because your spirit lives in them. Outside you, man cannot exist. You are man's sustainer. And amongst men, you have called upon some to be leaders. We pray tonight in thanksgiving for our commissioners, our leaders, they represent you in meeting the needs of this city and of your people. We pray that they be graced in this session with uncommon wisdom. We pray that they may have not so much the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God. We pray that you may bless them with the spirit of counsel we pray, O oh God, even as they preside over vexatious issues, that they may not address them as men, because they have your spirit of counsel. We pray for you to bless them with, uh, with courage as they face the vicissitudes of uh, the modern day. We pray for you to guard their hearts so that they may love people from deep within. As they deal with affairs of the lowly and uh, of those who are elevated, let their hand be fair. Give them a heart of justice. We know there are so many needs in this city today and there is so much expectation placed upon them. <coughs> we pray, oh God, that you may raise them for this season to govern this city as you would have them. Oh God, we pray for the city to be thankful to have these commissioners, these men and women who stand upright before you committed to serving them. We pray for thankful hearts, appreciative attitudes, and uh, the spirit of followership so that they may lead in peace and grace. We thank you for tonight's business, which we commit to you. We pray that you go ahead of them. We pray, oh God, that uh, all the issues be dealt with according to your will. Once more, we pray for the peace of this city. We pray for provision in every household. We pray for the protection of the weak. We pray, oh God, that uh, you may honor every man and woman in this city who will help his neighbor. We pray for that spirit of neighborliness to rest upon your people. Grant us peace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioners, your first order of business is item 3.1, which is to consider approval of the minutes for the regular, regularly scheduled 
City Commission meeting held on Thursday, January 5th. Uh, do I have move approval? I have second. A, a, move, a move for approval and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Trivet. Commissioner Brock? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Vice Mayor Murphy? Yes, sir. Mayor Fowler? Yes. Commission, the next order of business is um, a presentation from the Chamber of Commerce, Young Professionals of Johnson City. This is a year-end update and the launch <laughs> of the Move To website. And thank you all for being here. I don't know, Bob, if you're going to lead us off and then Mackenzie will follow. I'm the warm-up band. <laughs> thank you for being Mackenzie's here. The, the big Uh, great to be here today. Thank you for allowing us to come in. It was uh, 2022 was a very dynamic year for the chamber and also for our business community. Um, for, for us, you know, relocating to the, uh, the model mill was, was a huge undertaking for us. We were able to sell our building um, and, and it, we're now in a location that we feel better represents our organization to the community and we're seeing a lot of benefit. Uh, for that for that being located at the model mill these are just some of the things that have happened throughout the year of uh, many of the uh, the ribbon cuttings we had 46 of those our co-starters class um, that's a YP function on the bottom left hand corner on the bottom right hand corner is our past chair and presidents I mean we have the president of Mulligan flooring and and Blackburn Children's and Stigall and and uh, many of our businesses uh, Eastman Credit Union uh, that are represented in that organization and there's, and there's still business leaders uh, that are committed to our community and, and, and wanting to do many positive things. Tonight, I just want to give you a snapshot of some of the headlines and some of the things that we've been talking about and, and the conversations we have with developers and new businesses that are coming into the community. Uh, as you're aware, Johnson City was ranked number one in the Wall, by Wall Street Journal and Realtors.com in the emerging housing market in the fall of 2022. Uh, Washington County is at $7.4 billion and gross domestic product, and that's a 9.1% increase over the past year. It's just unprecedented that much uh, increase in GDP. And then our unemployment has been staying fairly steady. Uh, it's gone as low as 2.8%. Uh, at the end of October, it's 3.3. At the end of November, it's 3.2. One of the things we wanted to share in regards to population and the migration that we're seeing in the top line here, this is all the counties in the, um, in the region. Washington County has led in, in regards to uh, increase in population. But if you go by the columns, it tells you what our births have been, what our deaths have been. And of course, our death rate surpasses our birth rate. We have to recruit 726 people annually just to stay at ground zero. So um, we either need to have less deaths or more babies um, <laughs> or, or figure out how to continue to recruit people that, that offset that amount. The positive thing is the net migration was close to 2,000 or, or 1,900 folks. Um, our, our, so our net population is, is 1,200 um, or a 0.9% or a 1% growth, which is fairly solid and stable. And again, this was from 2020 to 2021, and we're still waiting on some of the numbers for um, uh, 2022. But uh, again, we're seeing other communities that have, have really stepped up. Green County has been surprising of the, of the number of migration. Uh, that's come into their community. When we're talking about GDP, this is from 2011 to 2021. Um, Washington County's GDP was about $4.8 billion in 2011, and now we're at 7.4% GDP. Half of that is housing market. So you can see the impact of having that house increase in housing builds and, and the sales and transactions that happen in the housing market what impact that has. Uh, we're anticipating this amount to continue growing. Uh, I will share as a comparison, um, 2006 or 2008, uh, Asheville was at $7.4 billion in GDP. Um, and now Asheville is at, at close to 17, 18 billion in, in GDP. Uh, but just as a, as a comparison sake, uh, to look at kind of where we are and seeing the growth that we're having. Uh, this was an interesting thing that we weren't aware, we we're aware of the positives of the school system, but 
Uh, Niche.com just rated Johnson City School District the number two school district out of 126 in the state of Tennessee. Uh, this is a national publication uh, that represents schools and a lot of people that are relocating look at this periodical to say what school systems are, uh, uh, are important or are, are, are being valued in their communities. Number one, of course, is Williamson County, but uh, number, number two is, is, is Johnson City School System. The other intriguing thing was uh, district with the best teachers in Tennessee, it was rated at number three, and then best places for teacher to teach in Tennessee is rated as number five. So again, from a, from a recruitment and business development standpoint, having this information is, is very positive for us. And um, it, it makes it easier for, for when we're having conversations of why do you need to relocate uh, to Johnson City. Again, many of the things that we've been doing is, is, is business development, um, our leadership classes, our small business uh, toolkits, um, our annual meetings, 46 ribbon cuttings, and we're on the path to continue doing that for this year. But one of the key um, areas that have, have had a lot of growth for us this past year have been the young professionals of Johnson City. So as I said, I'm just the warm-up band. Um, I'm gonna ask Mackenzie to come up and just kind of give you an update about the YP program. It's been a while since I've got to give you all an update on YP, so I'm super excited. Um, of course, we told you all last time I was here, um, the pillars for the program were going to be connect, lead, and serve. Um, so it's kind of funny to think about uh, in February, it'll be the one-year anniversary of our first member. So um, we're not even quite through with our first year yet, um, but in those first kind of 11 months, we had 45 events that all fell under connect, lead, and serve. Um, that was professional development, community service, um, after hours networking, um, just community events that we plugged into here in Johnson City already. Just a little bit of everything. Um, we completed 165 hours of service at our community service events alone. So we did one of those each month. So those 165 hours were spread out over 12 local nonprofits. Um, and through that, they also um, collected a little over 2,000 items and a little over $4,000 for those as well. We are sitting a little over 235 members currently, which I always tell Bob, um, it's kind of crazy to think about. We've not done any paid ads or anything like that. That has all been word of mouth um, or just people finding us on social media because we try to encourage our members to <coughs> tag us in pictures and share their experience. Um, so that's all just been organic. It's crazy to think about what it could be if we start to put some paid advertising before it. But at the same time, we want to make sure we're keeping up with the growth and still offering the quality um, through the program without it kind of overrunning us. <laughs> so we're happy with the way that it's growing steadily. We average probably a new member one every three days right now, if not more. Um, I think I had two come in my inbox even before I got in this meeting. So um, it's been super good to see all of that. Um, of course, some changes we're going to have um, in 2023, all based off the survey that we ran at the end of December, um, asking about what their experience has been, what they've expected, what they liked, what they would change, things of that nature. Um, some of the things will stay the same or would just modify a little bit to further fit the group as it's expanded. Uh, we're going to continue our monthly after hours socials. Those will now be at a different location every month, though, because we want to continue to support the local business community um, and kind of expose them to different venues maybe that they've not been to. Uh, we're still going to have at least one lunch and learn a month. I'm kind of going to expand on those two in this year, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, monthly breakfast networking has been one of the ones that has been probably the most attended, but was kind of surprising. We have seen a new face every single time we've held that event. Um, and we think it's a good entry point into the program. It doesn't seem um, as overwhelming coming into a breakfast where you're just expected to just get to know somebody they know that everyone in the room is kind of coming in with that same idea of like someone is going to speak to you you're not going to be left out um, and in the corner not getting to to get the same experience so continuing those we have changed the community service event from monthly to now quarterly through a partnership with United Way um, just because attendance at those wasn't what we wanted and we feel like offering those less frequently but getting um, more intentional with the project choosing, also because our nonprofits don't really have the staffing right now to have us come out on a Saturday, which is what works best with young professional schedules, it was kind of hard to be even able to organize 12 of those last year. So offering those quarterly, United Way is more aware of the exact needs of a nonprofit at that moment, and we're not just calling up somebody randomly and them saying, yeah, I can find a wall for you to paint or something. It's a little bit better pairing um, of our group and what they actually need to be doing. We're also going to keep up our quarterly outdoor rec events. Those have been really well received. We are going caving next month. 
Um, we're going to try and get them to break out of their comfort zones. No one's sold on that one yet, but we're working on it. Um, and we'll keep up our charity gala, except I think we're going to move it to New Year's Eve instead. Christmas was kind of a wild time for everybody, so just changing a few things to fit the group better. And then NetHub, actually, as it's been renamed recently, um, is coming forward um, and partnering with us on a podcast that's both going to help them market the region to other young professionals, but also just kind of help us tell our members' stories. So that's going to be super nice. Big changes outside of that. Um, you all have definitely heard that we've had TEDx Johnson City. It will be coming in June for the first time ever. Uh, this year's theme is going to be rewriting the Appalachian narrative. Again, just kind of telling our story better um, and getting young professionals I think empowering them to talk to kind of own the word Appalachian because I feel like sometimes it has a negative connotation to it and we're trying to tell them hey it's good to be proud of where you come from and and kind of taking over that language again so um, this year that's that'll be our first theme uh, the YPU night summit this is extremely recent so I had the privilege of attending this conference in Louisville Kentucky last fall Basically, it's a YP conference for all of their um, young professional groups in the state of Kentucky. That does not exist in Tennessee, so we talked about bringing it here and making a statewide one. Um, and when I mentioned that to their director, they said, how about you actually just apply to host ours? Because we're hoping to make this more of a nationwide uh, um, conference anyway. So we applied and they did choose us, so that will be the first weekend of November. Um, but basically, we're going to invite every YP group in the state of Tennessee, also Asheville, all the way down to Florida, because some of us were attending from out of state to the Louisville one as well. Um, but really hoping to have about 100 to 200 young professionals in Johnson City that weekend to do the same things. Um, professional development, some community, community service in downtown Johnson City on that Saturday, and um, kind of a mock-up of what we did in Louisville last year. So. Those were two big things, um, but another thing we wanted to try this year as a way to empower the young professional community, because as far as I'm concerned, membership's growing kind of naturally. I don't want to be focusing on that as much. Now I want to mobilize who we already have in the group um, and kind of get them to start taking initiative. We started a $10,000 mini grant fund where members can apply to have their own events using some funding. So, you know, if they have a speaker that they really wanted to come out for a while, they can apply for maybe $200 to be able to cover lunch and they can host that event, bring in their speaker. And that way it's impacting more than just the members that are in our group. It's young professionals all over the community. I don't want it to be limited to just 200. There's way more in Johnson City. And through this, it also allows our uh, members to be able to just have some leadership experience and being able to host events like that and get some experience there. So it can also just help them pay for trainings. Um, if they are wanting to attend a conference, like some of the ones that I've mentioned before, they can cover the registration for that and things of that nature. But that'll be our first time trying this out. Some other YP groups have uh, seen some success from that. So we're excited to see what our members get to do with it. And then move to Johnson City, which we've all been hearing about for a while, and we're super excited to release. Um, we'll be launching on February 1st. So, oh yeah, the Firefox, there we go. So this is about as close to launching as we can get. There's still a few things that they're working on um, because we did have some like custom plugins and things made to work exactly how I, we wanted it to. Um, there's a few things left that they are working out with the web host, um, but this is about, this is about finalized. Uh, Basically, a compilation of the things that we've had both spoken to us through the city or the visitor center that have said, hey, these are the questions pe people are looking on Google for that'll you know, turn up in SEO results, things of that nature. Um, and then recapping some of these rankings and things that we've been seeing. Our relocation guide, um, livability, which is something we're hoping to do this year as well. This will be updated with that once ever um, that is published. Um, we've thrown in some things about favorite restaurants, some reasons why Johnson City is always named, you know, top one, um, top ten, whatever it is in every ranking, whether it's schools and whatnot. Um, we kind of put those all in one big list uh, to explain why we're always so high on uh, all of these rankings. A moving checklist so they're able to download and say, you know, hey, when I get there, I need to find a nonprofit to serve with. I need to look into serving on a city board or council. Things of that nature beyond just moving. What do you do to get plugged into your community once you get here? Because that's really what we're focusing on. Um, we can sell you on the no state income tax and things all day, all day long, but we want you to get here and plug into the community just as much. So that'll be one of the three pages. There's also just some information on the region, outdoor rec, um, tourism, some of the big draws to the region, local attractions. Um, 
and of course, a lot of the website's goal um, is just to also capture data. So if they do have a question or they want to reach out, all of this is going to be recorded through the Contact Us button. We'll be able to track where they're coming from, um, who's looking, and then you know, if we get a request, depending on what it is, I can forward it on to the correct person. If it's a visitor center question, we can send it there. If they're actually looking for a realtor, we'll send that on. Um, but this way, we're actually able to get some data, too, outside of what we've had in the past at the chamber. Um, and also, it's just a list to follow back up on once they're interested, of course, we're going to keep reaching out and be like, hey, where are you in your home search now? Are you still looking at Johnson City? Why or why not? Yeah. We're looking at February 1st on that, and we're really excited. Is there anything that you all do not see reflected that you would want to add? Um, because that's the good thing is this will be able to change um, at, any, at any point in time, depending on if anybody has any suggestions. Or if we see something coming through the Contact Us button, um, quite often we can implement that on the website to prevent more requests. I would think just having a conversation with our community uh, development folks there okay. uh, who, who keep their finger on the pulse of most everything. So I do have a question. Okay. Of all the, the new um, folks who are coming into the YP organization, mm -hmm. Are you keeping track of how many are newly moved here or are these people who have lived here for a long time? Trying to. So that's the fun part about young professionals is they found out really quickly that surveys are optional. So sometimes I can get them to send in some feedback, um, other times not. So we actually just hired our first YP intern um, who's going to be coming on board to start merging some of the data we've been collecting mm -hmm. and updating our database. Um, because sadly those are not connected. We've not found a way yet for those to automatically update because we use so many different platforms. But we're going to make sure, you know, if they've had a new job recently, um, updating their ages, although some of them I will not usually try to call out on their birthdays. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we won't have to tell anybody if you turn 40. Um, but just some of those things that we've been trying to track, especially where they're living currently. Zip codes are something recently we started adding into the um, sign up form because we're just kind of even curious where across the county you're coming mm -hmm. from, let alone the region as a whole. Um, but unifying that literally starting next week when she officially starts. I guess I <clears throat> would add, I think, to what Commissioner Brock was saying. You asked about suggestions. Mm -hmm. I think the city made a commitment to the Young Professional Program because we recognize it's important both to the young professionals who are here and those we're trying to attract. We also made a sizable commitment to unifying our branded elements. And so mm -hmm. one of the things I see missing in the in the why Johnson City is in fact the branded elements that mm -hmm. Johnson City is using and so I would encourage you to find a way to incorporate those more fully so that you know when I go to Target I expect it to be round and red and when I go to Lowe's I expect it to be blue and square and and just so that we're not deploying resources in an inefficient way mm -hmm. by seeming to almost compete with our own messages. Absolutely. Arrow, um, uh, the design, the, the website actually tried to merge branding across all of the sponsors to make it cohesive so that they could all share it on theirs. But I will definitely put them in contact um, with your all's people to help kind of um, lend it a little more. We noticed yes. that, yeah, for sure. Try to keep it all yeah. as, as cohesive from that standpoint at least branded a little bit different so some of them think we're part of the city in this well but you are part of the city <laughs> we are. Yeah. And, and, and the city's logo is, right. is part of this is mm -hmm. yeah. but I'll definitely connect them to make sure it, it flows a little more cohesively thank you and you, you said that you got 235 members and you didn't do much marketing. Are you planning on doing more marketing for more young people to join? Yes. So part of what we do though, um, and I come from a marketing background, that's what my degree is in. Um, we were always taught to really aim for organic marketing where you capture people um, not through a salesy type pitch because a lot of my age group has grown up with ads being thrown at them on every platform um, that we kind of sense that really quickly and we don't like that because it seems very inorganic um, that's why we always correlate best with brands that really um, connect with a community service initiative and things of that nature we love things that seem a little more um, organic I would just say so even in our advertising um, we try to just empower members to um, share our group with others whether that's telling other people about them sharing the photos um, posting and tagging us in those, it really does work better than you would think. Um, I mean, I had social media stats included in the PowerPoint eventually, and I was like, no, I'm not going to bore everybody with those today. But I mean, across the board, we have grown, you know, thousand percent on every platform, and it's just been through members 
sharing their own content. Um, in the future, though, I mean, we do have printables and things that I take out to events and share that way, um, but we will th start um, doing some ads, at least especially for TEDx um, and some of our larger events, too. And those events also are marketing at their core. Even though they're just as much an event for people to attend, it's also just to get our name out there, too. So, McKenzie, I'm just kind of guessing I might be a little bit too old for the YP group, although I'd love to be a part of it. <laughs> and, I think, and I think John's even <laughs> aged out. But can you just share with the public uh, what's even the eligibility? John, to it's come to yeah. that. So it's 21 to 40, um, which I always joke with people. I'm never going to ID you, but, you know, if somebody turns you in every once in a while, you know, we might have to look at things. But um, we, we try to be very relaxed on that end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but 21 to 40 is really what we just aim for. Um, it really just seems like that's the group. I always tell people, you know, you think, oh, it's so hard making friends in high school or college, and then it just magically gets better when you graduate, but it's still the same in your 20s and 30s. It's just as hard, especially when you're moving to a new area to kind of start over and meet people that have the same interests. So um, our platform really just kind of helps um, make those connections a lot easier and gives them a foundation to go from. Mackenzie, I think you've done a great job, and I really appreciate that you got a lot of different things going on, trying a lot of different things, but I really appreciate the fact that you're constantly reevaluating, seeing how to make things better or if it even needs to continue. And, and so I think that's part of your great success is Thank you. continual, continual improvement. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Very good. Anything else? And Bob, you're okay too. <laughs> you're well, okay. Bob, thanks for, thanks for giving the update. Thanks for giving the update, so I don't have to later. <laughs> well, it was a it was a great investment to help it kind of get kick started, and you guys have just run with it, which is just terrific. I would think too, uh, you know, maybe in 2023 that we have some focus groups of some of the YP, um, uh, organization, you know, in the organization. It, we did that uh, two or three years ago, and it was just. Oh my gosh, it just opened our eyes. So this would be a good source to tap into. Absolutely. And we did receive some, qual I would say, qualitative data from the survey too. Um, I think the open-ended questions are always the best. I mean, we've got some demographics and things too, but when only 40 out of 240 take it, it's not indicative of the whole group. But as far as the open-ended questions at the end of like, what do you expect to see? Um, what's Johnson City missing that you would love to see here? Things of that nature, I'd love to share that with you all too. Yeah, we'd love it's it. just too much to include in here, but um, they're usually, like you said, extremely open and, and willing to give ideas, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Appreciate Anybody it. Else? Commission, your next order of business is to consider the appointment to the Johnson City Housing <coughs> Authority. Uh, this is one appointment. This is off cycle. Um, the request, we advertise for this, uh, this request. It has to be a member of the public housing community. And at the time, we did not receive any applicants. Uh, since then, we have received a recommendation from the Housing Authority and the uh, person has been willing to serve. And part of the requirement of that board is that you have to have someone on the board that represents the community. So is there a name yes. proposed? No. Yes, the, the name has been proposed. Um, Gail Waters. Gail Waters. Gail Waters. Gail Waters. Move, oh, move okay. approval. Second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Right. Mr. Triffitt, would you call the roll? Uh, Commissioner Brock. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. Commissioner Wise. Yes. Vice Mayor Murphy. Yes. Mayor Fowler. Yes. Commission, the next order of business is consideration of the consent agenda. Yes. All right. I will start on my right tonight. Oh. Well, like to I will anything? pull 6.1.3 and 6.1.4 just to talk about the process and what we're doing there. Vice Mayor. Yes, sir. In addition to Commissioner Wise's, uh, I'd like to pull 6.1.1 and 6.1.5. All right. Commissioner. 6.1.6. Oh, did somebody pull point four? Yep. Yes. Okay. okay. And John. Y'all were all on the 6.1s. Yeah. Uh, I just had, I guess, 6.3.1. All right. I guess we will start in order with 6.1.1. Vice Mayor Murphy. 
And we have the fire chief bell coming up. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here with you tonight. Uh, what we're wanting to do with this is apply for a FEMA AFG grant. We, we apply for these annually, trying to get equipment that we necessarily can't fund with our capital. Uh, this goes, lo goes along with our plan for a five-year projection, what we want to be able to offer to the citizens of Johnson City. And what this is is a specialized vehicle to be able to handle a vast number of different types of situations that we'd run into. They would respond on structure fires with this, but also uh, MVAs, motor, motor vehicle accidents, uh, specialized technical rescues, such as hazmat, uh, structural collapse, trench, confined space, and so forth. Uh, this is a, a very unique vehicle, to say the least, uh, but it would really enhance our abilities to be able to serve the citizens of Johnson City. And we're hoping to apply for this. This is a 90% match grant. The FEMA will pay 90% of it. We would be responsible for the remaining 10%. And the way this is, we put the application in now, as soon as we're, if we're approved to do that. Um, typically, you're looking July, August, somewhere in there is when they would finally make the decision on it. And I believe there is $360 million available for FEMA to provide to citizens or the different departments, uh, excuse me. So we have a very good chance of this, and what we're applying for is considered a uh, very high priority. They label these for different tasks, and ours is the highest priority is what we're asking for for this. Well, Chief, you've left me curious about this vehicles. Can you yeah. describe what makes it so unique? Uh, transport. Basically, yes, transport. It's going to be transporting various pieces of equipment to handle any of these situations. Mm -hmm. The way it is right now, if we have a structural collapse, we can respond with our normal apparatus and engine or a ladder truck, but with this, we'll be, and we have to wait for a truck with a trailer with all the specialized equipment to get there, so it's delayed typically 30 minutes. This will be getting somebody on the scene within five minutes. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to do the initial phase of that, hopefully invoke a rescue or whatever we have going on at that time to help expedite the situation and make it a lot is, better for is this does this vehicle the visuals of the vehicle does it have hoses attached a jaws of life i mean well, i'm still kind of we've actually we, what's, we what's went it? away from the old style the jaws of life the hoses and all that connected to a hydraulic unit everything's battery powered now okay so it's more mobile so we're able to take it but we do have all that on there uh various things to be able to build shoring up if a structure is collapsing we're able to stiffen it up basically so we'll go up and build the bracing so we can actually go in and do the rescue at that point to make it safe for us to go in. Nobody will carry all that specialized equipment on that. So I'm assuming you need approval to apply for the grant because that's a requirement of FEMA to see that we want you to apply for it? Well, what is it? Yeah, I think the, the practice has been to uh, request approval from the commission so that we know that the, that the commission is aware of it and it will require a 10% okay. match. Okay. Yes. Yes, we always ask permission before we apply for this grant because we know that it's tied to that. Time. So the equipment costs a whole lot more than the vehicle costs. <laughs> no, this will actually take into account equipment as well. Okay. There's a provision of this that will go for buying the equipment needed for this. Okay. So the apparatus included. itself is probably uh, the last quote I got was 755,000 for the apparatus, and the remainder would be for equipment. Yes, I know it's astronomical. <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately, that's where we went with the cost of all of these vehicles. <coughs> Anything else? Uh, which which no. station are you planning to keep it at? <laughs> right now, we would probably be basing it here at Station 3, the closest one, because that's basically the central station. We can get on the interstate quickly and move north if we need to. Uh, depending on how the needs change with the population density, we'll look at all that and make an adjustment from that at that point once it's in. Thank It'll you. take almost three years to build this truck. It's the time frame that we are in right now. Uh -huh. They are way behind on everything. Anything Thank else? You. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. Thank yes. you, Rich. Thank you. All right, 6.1.3. Yeah, I asked to pull the next two because they deal with a, a road naming and renaming. Um, so I just wanted to kind of acknowledge for the public's benefit that we're doing that and then the process by which these two have come to us. Yes, sir. There is a, uh, a process, Commissioner, uh, 
that has been approved by the city as well as our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. The way this particular first item took place is we had a recommendation to name the entrance road to the Wing Deer Park Athletic Expansion. The department followed the policy which states that we are to accept names for a period of 30 days, which we did. There were a total of 13 names submitted. Of those, we submitted those to our GIS department and Washington County 911 and received approval on 10 of those, at which time we conducted two public forums as we're required to do, one November 8th and another November 29th. After the last one, uh, it was put before our Parks Advisory Board. The vote was six to one to recommend to you Champions Lane. Uh, that was our first one. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And that's a road that does not have a name? It does not have a name, no, okay. sir. And then the next one, 6.1.4. If, if, if we may, if we may, yes, sir. I, I would like to, to know the explanation behind the name. Behind the name? Yeah. Why champion Champions Lane? They were given a, several options, and I think if you look at the ones that are in your packet, you'll see a lot of those, I think, were bat and ball related, such as fastball, slider, curveball. None pertain to soccer, football, rugby, other sports. Champions sort of fit all sports. And this so is that's the access they, road into the new expansion for Wing Deer where we're building new ball fields. Yes, diamonds sir. and rectangles. Yes, sir, diamonds and rectangles. Uh, item number two, those were both renaming. Uh, one was to rename Alabama Street, the other Chamber Drive. The department followed, again, the policy. A total of two names each were met, uh, met the qualifying process. Uh, these were reviewed by Washington County 911 and GIS and approved. The names submitted for Alabama Street were Tweetsie Street and Van Brocklin Way, with Van Brocklin Way being the only qualifying name after further review. The names submitted for Chamber Drive were Tannery Drive and Tannery Knobs. Both of those were considered eligible names. Two public forums were conducted, one on December 6th, the other on December 14th, at which time the Parks Advisory Board met and voted 7-0 to recommend Van Brocklin Way and Tannery Drive. I might like to note as well that the naming policy was um, passed by the commission and signed by Mayor Ralph Van Brocklin, of whom we are going to name this uh, Alabama correct. Street. And so I think it's very fitting and I can't wait to call his wife and let, him, let her know. Yeah. We're very excited about mm -hmm. it. And these are unique in that these are all roads and streets adjacent to parks and recreation right. facilities. Yes, sir. The Parks and Rec Advisory Board is not involved in street renamings more generally, but this is because they're adjacent to parks. And I can think of no one more suited than Ralph to be remembered in that way at the Tweetsie at Trail. The Tweetsie Trail. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. For many reasons. And uh, he was an avid UT Balls fan too, so it was only right to rename that Alabama Street. <laughs> <laughs> That's really why we did it. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. going to go there. Go, go balls. <laughs> Anything else? No. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. All right. 6.1.5. Aaron? That was mine, I think. Yeah. I, I can explain right. that or answer any questions anyone's got on that. Yeah. I think just an overview, uh, particularly for the public, on this. Uh, what this is was there was a. Um, Disaster declaration in April is. Okay. What? I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you were on the next one. So that this that is point vice, five is not mine. <laughs> vice mayor's. Oh, okay. Go ahead, though. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. okay. Well, and that's the one we're on is point five, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. So there was a disaster declaration made in April of 2020 as a federal declaration. Uh, we had some damage uh, around some bridges and some creek banks. There was extensive flooding. There were straight line winds. Um, it was a multitude of different uh, disasters that were occurring at the same time. Uh, we had to repair some undershoring. We had to repair some damaged uh, and washed out uh, water lines and put all those back in. And so uh, the engineering department um, uh, submitted um, 
the application for reimbursement, and that's what this is. The work has already been completed. Uh, the expense has already been exhausted. Uh, and so this is our way of getting that reimbursement back for those repairs that were done because of the storm. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you. And then 6.1.6, .6, Commissioner Brock. And, and 6.1.6 .6 is a typical resolution that you guys are asked to do periodically. Uh, this one is for the issuance from TDA, uh, THDA of uh, tax exempt bonds. Uh, the Health and Education Committee has already met on this and agreed to uh, uh, issue these bonds, but they also, T THDA also wants to make sure that the governing body in the community is in favor of the project and that there's nothing outstanding that would uh, prevent uh, this project from going forward. Um, and, and we have a representative here from LHP, which this is the project that's going on on South Rhone Street. Uh, this is a part of the additional funding that they need to complete that project of 145 uh, homes uh, for um, the low to moderate income uh, disabled and elderly uh, families. Um, so we did have a public hearing today, uh, January the 19th at four o'clock. Uh, for any citizens to comment on this uh, resolution, and no one was present to comment on this resolution other than the press. And Mr. Trivet, this um, this is not debt on the city this books is at all. Absolutely no debt or no liability on the city whatsoever. This is just us approving the issuance from debt of from THDA for the project. For the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And. We do have a representative of LHP here if you guys have any further questions on that or anything. Say all the way from Chicago. He did come in from Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just today. Yeah. Well, I, I guess we ought to ask him a question since he yeah, traveled all the way here. All the way. You want to Might come well. up? I'll ask you one. Yeah. Maybe he could tell the, the timeline. That's of, exactly uh, what I was going to yes. ask him. <laughs> 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 Hello, everyone. Um, Talal Shikarshi here with LHP. Great seeing you all again. Happy to answer any question you may have. Yeah, just maybe want to go through the timeline now that you get these approvals. What's next steps? And of course, yeah. So we are going through and submitting our low-income housing tax credit application in the first round uh, here in the spring. And so hopefully, if we get the award, then that should allow us to close in the fall of this year. And we're going through and also applying for uh, a loan, loan application through HUD. So all, all in all, we should hopefully be closing sometime this fall. Okay. And then it'll take about uh, 20 months to develop the property. Mm -hmm. And that's when we will be transferring all of uh, John Spears' residents over there. So, so 2024 is going to be a real busy year. 2024 is going to be a very busy year. Yeah, uh, but at 20 months, it would be 2025 would be is when we'll be moving. Exactly. People. 2024 is going to just be busy for the contractors and mm -hmm. everybody building it. Very good. Anything else? Anything else you want to share with us? Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Happy you very much. As always you appreciate bet. it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. And the last one is 6.3.1. Is that me? John, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I was just curious, since the purchase of three ADA compliant minivans, yeah. I was just curious, there wasn't any information, as, are, are these replacement or are they additional? We have someone from the transit department here. Um, can, would you mind coming up and answering questions about the vans? Um, I am not sure if they're replacements or if they're new. I would assume they're replacement, but I'm not sure. Get a lot of miles on them. Mm -hmm. Hi. Good evening. I'm speaking in front of Dave. Welcome. <laughs> well, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> My name is uh, Brad Osborne, and I'm a or senior transit planner with Johnson City Transit. <clears throat> it's nice to meet you guys. You too. Thanks so for coming. The, the question was um, is this replacement vans or are these new vehicles? These are new vehicles replacing uh, uh, current vehicles. <clears throat> uh, the, the vehicles, the, their minivans that they're replacing are from uh, 2014 and 2013. 
And so these will be uh, 2022 models. And how are these deployed? Like, how do y'all use them? These are used for our paratransit uh, services, oh, which okay. is, uh, <clears throat> these are, have a, they're ADA, so they have a wheelchair lifts, and they, they, these will exclusively be used for our paratransit services. Okay, do you call, I mean, you call for that, or, or do they have a route, or how, how does it work? These are uh, on demand, so people would call in advance for these services. Are these services free to the public? They are not. Uh, they are at two dollars a day. Very affordable. Yes. Yeah. Right yeah. to the front door. Yeah. How, how many uh, paratransit vans do we run, um, or do we have in the department? I'm trying to think what our on any given day. I think you could say maybe nine, mm -hmm. and that that's just paratransit vans. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Did thank good you. your first time. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is all. Do I have a motion? I make a motion. Oh. Second. <laughs> so Vice Mayor moved and John second. Any other discussion? Uh, Mr. Trivet, would you call the roll? Uh, Commissioner Brock? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Vice Mayor Murphy? Yes. Mayor Fowler? Yes. Commission, your next order of business is uh, consideration and second reading. Um, this one is ordinance number 4831-22. This is the second reading and public hearing. This is a rezoning, rezoning number 1100, Cobble Drive, Drive Coffee through located at North Rhone and Woodbriar. And I think Justin is presenting this one. Give me one second, I apologize, I'm not prepared. All right, sorry about that. So good evening, I apologize for that. Um, this is the second reading, as, as Ms. Ball has mentioned, for the Cobo Coffee, Coffee rezoning. Um, this will be obviously the public hearing as well. Uh, some of the questions that y'all posed to us in the first reading we did, um, research and staff, and Am uh, specifically Amber did a, a pretty good job of um, pulling this together. Uh, as we mentioned before, obviously this is a rezoning on a property north of, uh, on North Rhone Street, across the street from Indian Trail Middle. Um, this is a, a rezoning from B2, or I'm sorry, R2 uh, to um, B2, I believe. B4. B1, I'm sorry. Uh, and it's taken a second, I apologize. We're almost there. Go ahead and do this while we're doing that. That way, it's pulling off the drive. I'm, that's why I'm copying the other one. We'll be all right. When I get back to the office, I'll check to make sure we paid that bill. For yeah. there you go. <laughs> Apologize about that. I, I meant to do it. Uh, so as I mentioned, like I said, now that I have some uh, talking points, R2 to B1. And this is the second time you all have seen it. Uh, and this is a public hearing. I guess we'll 
we'll go this way. So this is the property obviously highlighted in the hatched area. The R2 surrounding it is that more pale yellow. The R3 is across the street and that is Indian Trail Middle School. Uh, R2 is the current density for low density residential. B1 is the neighborhood business and it is to allow construction and operation of a drive through coffee. Uh, again, as a rehash or recap, the property is highlighted in the red hatch. You have North Roan running north to south uh, with Indian Trail Baseball Field um, right across the street. You have the neighborhood and uh, Woodbriar to the south. You can see some of the um, aerials as well as the. Oh, press the wrong button. That's why. We'll start over. We'll go through it quicker. All right. Uh, this is the property, as, as we explained last time, the annexation. You can see kind of some of the annexation going further north um, along North Rhone with the years. Obviously, the lighter is, is the uh, 1980s annexation, the darker greens, 1990s, and so forth. But the yellow specifically would be the 2000s. So you can kind of see the infill development. The property is highlighted with the white arrow. So you can kind of see what's relation to it. Uh, the adjacent properties have seen rezoning a request recently as of 1998-99 um, and 2008 for the property immediately adjacent to the north of this property highlighted with the yellow star. Some of them were approved. Obviously you see the R2 to be 4 in 1998 on the corner of Whitewood Boulevard and North Rhone, but you do see that the RP3 was denied in 2008 to the property immediately adjacent to this property as well as the rezoning in B4 uh, in 1998 to the property slightly north of that. With that being said, this is the concept scale or concept plan. It is to scale with three feet per box on the plan. As we mentioned in the last um, uh, hearing, meeting, uh, the, the plan is actually will be flipped. Um, a 24 by 12 foot building, driveway emergency access off of North Rhone Street, um, parking, stormwater, landscape type one buffer will all be addressed at the site plan stage. Uh, this is the plan that's been flipped, obviously, to give you a better idea. You can see the driveway has been moved to south to accommodate the right turn and deceleration lane that TDOT and our own city staff has reviewed, uh, along with future site plans for engineer drawings. This shows some of the stacking spaces that we talked about. Zoning code requires three. Uh, per this plan, it shows about seven. TDOT is requiring a uh, right turn lane that would accommodate five to ten more, depending on the length. This is an architectural example um, provided by the applicant for the property in hand. Uh, this kind of shows you the layout of the property with the adjacent setbacks for B1 as it relates to obviously the front setback on North Rhone and the rear setback adjacent to the residential. This is a survey of the 10 existing B1 locations. Uh, obviously the future comprehensive, the comprehensive <laughs> plan for the future land use map shows this as being residential uh, and as I mentioned earlier B1 is um, a neighborhood residential type of zoning district. You can kind of see the um, natural migration of the current zoning, current land uses and proposed future land uses. You can see a house that easily fits on the property adjacent to this on North Rhone. Um, and how it would comparably fit. We do have concerns, planning staff does have concern, development services concerns regarding um, backing out on the North Rhone. Uh, but in researching that, we have found um, that, that TDOT would have to allow that. So that is an alternative uh, use of the property. The bridge plan shows that uh, we do hope to encourage infill development. We identify and, um, and identify zoning sufficient land that's suitable for future commercial development and provide neighborhood commercial uh, that are limited in size and accessible to residential neighborhood residents. Uh, we do hope to promote the growth of retail and we do feel that overall the bridge plan does fit that and we do feel that it recruits and attracts new businesses. However, as we do speak for the city as a whole and we are one entity uh, in talking with public works and other departments, we, do, we have addressed a number of challenges uh, that, that y'all pointed out to us and we did a little bit, bit of research on. Uh, for example, future development specifically along North Rhone will increase traffic. Um, so much so that possibly a uh, signal at Roan and Lamberth may be met. That, that is very unlikely in talking with some of our uh, counterparts and other departments, but we feel that, that it may trigger a light, but it will be very difficult to prove that, particularly with the uh, lack of traffic on Lamberth. So I don't know that that's going to be uh, a mitigating issue in the future, so something else to think about, as well as the project should provide 15 
vehicle storage in an outside lane on North Rhone, but what does that do to the traffic? Again, something else to consider uh, as y'all are taking this up. Uh, Bright Ridge, we did reach out to them specifically about the polls. I know that that was brought up at a previous meeting, and they mentioned that two primary polls would need to be relocated. Without a firm site plan, it would be very difficult to show exactly how many and how much dollars that's going to cost the applicant, uh, but underground utilities may also be impacted by this as well with the location of the driveway and the uh, location of the building in relation to that right away. Uh, we did reach out, as y'all requested. We, we talked with both, and the letters should be in your packet of the superintendent of the school system, the principal of Indian Trail Middle, as well as the school resource officer for this school. Obviously, the SRO said that it is a busy school. <laughs> no surprise there. Uh, a school zone on a five-lane highway, but that the officer currently acts as a traffic signal, and an additional increase in use in that area, particularly in front of the school, uh, would be dangerous particularly with inclement weather and, and dark mornings, uh, and then it would increase that hazard. The principal of Indian Trail Middle said that uh, traffic has been a problem for nine years, and why they jokingly said a coffee shop across the street from a school uh, would benefit his teachers, uh, it, it would add a, a very negative impact to the, the bus movements and the traffic movements for that. Uh, and they highly suggest that a traffic signal uh, be installed prior to considering this. However, as I mentioned earlier, in talking with city staff, uh, we feel that that's going to be a long time coming, so something to keep in mind. And I mentioned, the superintendent, uh, congestion has been an increasing problem over the several years. A signal should be installed, but an additional business would add to an already uh, dangerous situation. So planning staff, again, uh, we, as we mentioned, uh, we do have positive aspects of it. However, as, as we're looking at it as a whole, holistically as the city uh, in its entirety with all the other departments, uh, obviously the school system, the SRO, superintendent, public works, uh, at this point we feel that overall um, we are recommending denial. That is obviously contrary to the last meeting, but again, the, the overwhelming uh, evidence is, as well as our research led by y'all, but also uh, on our own accord, uh, has changed some things, and we wanted to make sure that we made that very clear and aware. While Planning Commission did recommend approval, at this point, uh, we are recommending denial. And as this is a public hearing, I'm available for any questions before you open them, if you also choose, and available for any questions afterwards as well. The applicant is here as well. Any questions? Thank you. Um, um, I appreciate the in-depth uh, work that you've done, and particularly contacting Bright Ridge. And I believe in the letter that Bright Ridge sent, it was fifteen thousand dollars a pole, that, yes, uh, because those are very large, mm -hmm. large uh, structures out there. So, but th thank you for doing this this work. All right. If nothing further, I will open the public hearing. I will say that uh, we welcome you here tonight. If you're going to speak, if you would. Please give your name and address, and we will limit you to three minutes. And if you do happen to be saying the same thing the person in front of you had just said, you can come up and say agree and go back, and we're fine with that too. So just uh, we do welcome you here tonight. I will open the public hearing. Okay. Um, hi, my name's Kate Craig. I live at 410 Lambeth Drive. So one of the streets that is impacted by this. And there actually is traffic on Lambeth Drive, just to say before and after school. <laughs> um, but I agree with the new assessment that this should not be approved. Just having sat at that light or that stop sign right now, thinking that it's past time for a light to be there, trying to turn left. But also the care and concern about the students before after school trying to get there. So I really just want to echo what was said. And I'm very appreciative. I'm appreciative to those who voted against this last time. Thank you. And I hope, and I, and I appreciate everybody who responded to my, my email. So I just want to say thank you to that as well. Um, but really, I hope you'll take the new recommendation under consideration. Thank, thank you. Could, could you repeat your name, please, for me? Kate Craig. Kate Craig. Yes, sir. Thank you. I will give Mr. Trivet a break since this is not his normal job. He's taken over for a little while, so he's got to write everything down. So, so we're trying to really slow. Let me say it twice. Well, also, I'm trying to start the clock. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's got three jobs going on right now. So. I'll, I'll talk fast, a bit slow. Uh, quickly, my name is Brad Batt, B-A-T-T. -T. I live at 4002 Glaze Road in Steeple Chase, right behind the Indian Trail. Um, I appreciate your comments, uh, Commissioner Brock, and your vote against this, uh, Mayor Fowler. And I would ask that the other three commissioners change your vote to no. 
as a terrible location for specifically a drive-through business that is going to necessitate traffic in order to be successful. So while I uh, applaud small business owners, this is just a bad, bad location sandwiched in between two subdivisions <coughs> um, where kids cross the road as well uh, before and after school. So I'd appreciate if the city would keep that in mind and vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria Camp, I live at one Windridge Court, Johnson City. And I would just like to agree with this gentleman who just spoke. I live in the neighborhood, I've seen the traffic jams. And I think Indian Trail is expanding its enrollment, right? They're going from middle school to include elementary or primary? No, it'll just continue to be a middle school, but it's, it's 12, 1,300. It's Actually, it's smaller now. There, yeah. Yeah. It's only about 900 and something. Really? Yeah, yeah. That we moved but, fifth but grade out, growing. so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it has room to grow, mm -hmm. right there. <laughs> My name is Ted Mowry, and I live on the west side of this, all of the west side. And I'm really concerned about property values when you have a commercial project right behind you, which will occupy hundreds of cars a day to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. My name is Mike Duncan. I live at 4000 West Inglewood Boulevard. So since nobody from Inglewood has mentioned this, I'm going to throw another street on, on you got this. got it on your shirt uh, there. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, 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 that's a different thing. But uh, I just want to echo, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the proposal is to deny this, and I would ask all the commissioners to deny this. I, I just think that what we're hearing from Lambeth and Shadowwood and the, the streets that are uh, around this area and are affected, that, that, that this is just not a good idea, and that there's other places that a coffee shop, retail business, and so forth could move down further towards Carroll Creek. Uh, I actually counted six locations tonight on my way home that have big for sale signs sitting right there. So I think there's other places that a, a, a retail business uh, could, could benefit the city, but uh, I would ask that you leave Indian Trail area and just keep it the way it is and deny it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Um, my name is Andrea Coble. I'm the applicant. I live at 4103 Sioux Drive, Johnson City. Um, I understand that emotions are running high on my plan to open a small coffee drive through on this property. A few surrounding neighbors have called upon whoever they can to get this rezone request denied. It's gone so far as contacting the local news and radio stations to create fear over the safety of the children attending Indian Trail Middle School. I was not contacted for comment when these stories were being reported. I'm fairly new to Johnson City, and I don't know many people to call upon to help promote the positive aspects this business will bring to our community. <laughs> Neighbors surrounding my property keep mentioning they want to leave it as green space. If they wanted the vacant lot to remain green space, they had plenty of opportunity to purchase it while it was for sale. I purchased this property with the intention of developing it for my small coffee drive through According to the city planners, my project meets all of the requirements and codes for it to be rezoned to be one. If this can't be approved, I'll be moving forward to develop it with the current zoning allowances. I believe the coffee drive through I'm proposing is the best use of this property and will be more desirable than my other option. If safety and traffic issues are the main concern, I invite all of you to drive by this area during school drop-off and pickup times. I drive through this school zone every day during these times and have never had to stop because of traffic congestion. The speed limit slows down to 25 miles per hour, but the cars flow smoothly on North Rhone Street through the school zone. Also consider that the drop off and pickup times are a tiny portion of the day. There are also weekends, holidays, and the summer months where there is no school in session. I researched crash data maps on North Rhone Street between Lambeth Drive and Carmel Drive the data provided is from January 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2022. There has been a total of one vehicle crash in this area in the past three years due to distractive driving and no one was injured. I recently visited Open Doors Coffee Shop and drive through in Johnson City. 
They are located next to Northside Elementary School. I was there during the morning drop-off time and did not see a traffic or safety problem and they operate a busy drive through and sit-in cafe. I have shared my coffee drive through plan with many residents in the area. All have thought it is a great idea and something we really need in this part of town. Principal Jacobs, Principal Jacobs at Indian Trail Middle School wrote in an email to the city that he supports growth and small businesses in Johnson City <clears throat> and has said, who wouldn't want a coffee shop next to their work site? He did request a traffic light be installed at Lambeth. It sounds like this is something the school has been requesting for some time. I was told at my last meeting with the city planners that there isn't enough traffic in this location to put in a light at this time. Johnson City has experienced explosive growth over the past couple of years. More residential developments are being built and services have struggled to keep pace with this growth. Projects such as this one I'm proposing are needed and will be welcomed in our community. I hope that you will consider the positive aspects of having a small business that will provide a convenience for many people and possibly some growing pains for a few. Thank you for your consideration and for the time spent by the city planners on the rezoning request. I appreciate all of your time and your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I will close the public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Yes. So I, I would, if I may. You may. Um, I voted to advance this on first reading for a number of reasons. I felt there were questions that still needed to be answered um, of staff. I had questions about the application of B1. I am a strong proponent of a property owner's right to use their property. Um, and so I don't deny requests flippantly, and I wanted it to come to public hearing. Now, I think if anybody goes back and watches the meeting, you would see that the 3 2 vote was not really enthusiastic on anybody's part. Um, and I think for those of us that voted, we did so as much to get to public hearing and to get questions answered related to a number of these questions. I will tell you that I am opposed to the request in part because I think B1 is intended for a neighborhood business. And a neighborhood business is a business you walk to the end of your street to. It is a business intended to cater to people who are engaging it as much by bicycle and on foot as by an auto, automobile. A drive through coffee venue is the antithesis of a neighborhood business. Everybody's, the intention is that you're engaging it in a motor vehicle. And so that just, a B1 may technically allow you to do what you want to do, but from a land use and a, a philosophy behind what land use we apply to a piece of property, it just doesn't make sense because it's not a neighborhood business. It's a drive through coffee shop on a five lane arterial road through town. And so for that, I would make a motion to deny the request. I'll second. Any further discussion? No, you took every comment I had. Well, I'm sorry, you can have some of that. <laughs> it's back. all right. No, but I, I think a lot of times we read things in the paper and of course see a split vote and make assumptions, but I think there were a lot of concerns. Uh, I mean, I personally drive through both of those school districts at least once a day, if not twice. The comparison, yes, they're both coffee shops, but it's it's really apples and oranges in the fact that, you know, Northside is more of that neighborhood where you're not on a five lane. And, and while driving past Indian Trail on a five lane at 25 miles is not necessarily um, as um, precarious, trying to get out onto that five lane um, after dropping a child off um, is, is very precarious and, and a lot of times I think is a burden to other neighborhoods as people try to cut through to get to other streets just to get to work or wherever they're trying to go. Um, you know, the, the lot is very restrictive um, as far as the capacity um, and, and so I appreciate staff doing a little extra due diligence to reach out to the school systems and, and to the SRO who is on that street every morning and afternoon um, to get some further input. Appreciate it. 
I'll just add one thing too, and Ms. Cobble, um, uh, last uh, at our last meeting, of course, I voted no from the beginning, and and, and I can absolutely tell you, not, I had not heard from one single person in the neighborhoods at all. Uh, my um, concern about this was what I stated last time, and then as we looked in and did further research, you know, some of those things were, were um, you know, came came forward that we could make a, even a more informed decision. And so, um, uh, people do get emotional when things get built in their in their neighborhoods. There's no doubt about that. But my decision had nothing to do with emotion whatsoever. It's doing due diligence on this project, the amount of congestion that would be added to the to inside of a school zone, and that that was the the real issue for me, and the fact that the schools had not weighed in on it as well. And I am probably the most well the biggest proponent of small business in Johnson City and getting businesses to come here. But I just don't think this is the right spot. I would love to find a spot just north of there to have the same thing right before you get the Indian Trail and not right across the street from it. So anything else? Uh, I think it, it's only right if I share. Okay. I was a part of the Regional Planning Commission who voted seven to one in favor of this rezoning. And uh, we looked at the space and the location, we did not take in consideration of the school and the heavy traffic. It was definitely an oversight. And for 10 years, I've had the opportunity to travel up and down North Roan Street. And when we know the history of North Roan Street, we also have to take into consideration that it's a major artery. It ties right into old Kingsport Highway. There are people who travel each and every day up and down that road to go to work from Kingsport to John City or from, King, uh, from John City to Kingsport. Um, and so uh, also realize that that, enti that entire side of North Rhone Street is underutilized. There's a lot of for sale signs in that area. Um, it needs some kind of use. But if we allow one business, then it opens the Pandora's box for more all along that road, and there's no going back. I am in support of business. I'm in support of entrepreneurs. Uh, I do think that the concept and the idea is brilliant. I love coffee. <laughs> and actually, I live five minutes from the location but also have to take in consideration uh, our citizens and what's best for the children across the street. And so I will have to change my stance on the decision I made before, which I've done rarely. And I don't, I mean, when you're better educated to make the decisions, then you explain why you change your position. And so my position has changed on tonight based on a, a lot of conversations I've had with people in the community, a lot of research I've done on my own, and hearing our commissioners on today. So I'm opposed to the rezoning of this location. Mayor, could I add one yes. thing too? I think sometimes when we get these requests, people automatically equate big multi-lane roads with commercial development. So the idea is, oh, there's this big road, it should obviously be commercial. And yet, if you look around our community, we have multiple examples of big arterial or collector streets that have large stretches. Look at Sun Sunset, for example. It's a four-lane road almost the whole way from the mall out to the food city, but large sections of that are not developed commercially, or they're developed at a, at a very low intensity like an MS-1. Another example of that is University Parkway, large sections of University, but major road, lots of traffic count, but we're not throwing intensive commercial uses all up and down University Parkway. And so while Roan Street has developed commercially, there's large sections of North Roan in that particular vicinity that have not, and they're clustered up at the intersection at Carroll Creek, 
or at Boone's Creek Road, but it's not in the entirety of 36 from Oakland Avenue out to Zach's. And so just so that we're clear, just because there's a four or five lane road in front of it doesn't mean our ultimate intention is it's going to have a high intense uh, commercial use. So. Anything else? There was a second. We do yes. have a first and second. Yes, yes. Commissioner yeah. Boxing. Mr. Yeah. Trippett, would you read the rule, please? Uh, read the motion again. The motion so was to deny. Uh, Commissioner Brock? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Hunter? Commissioner Wise? Yes. Vice Mayor Murphy? Yes. Mayor Fowler? Yes. Commission, the next order of business is item 7.2, which is ordinance number 4832-22. This is the second reading in public hearing. This is an ordinance to rezone land located at 604 Leisure Lane from I-1 Light Industrial District to B-4 Planned Arterial District. And we have Justin here to go over this one. Are there changes since the last time? Yes, sir. Well, then I would pretend like you didn't have a PowerPoint. I think it's, it's <laughs> public hearing. That's though. exactly what I did. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, we, um, we can go through, through this fairly quickly, as, as Commissioner Wise stated. Um, <clears throat> 604 Leisure Lane, uh, it's, it's looking to go from an I-1 to a B-4. Uh, long story short, this is a split zone lot. For the development of that pro property, which is largely B4 to begin with, uh, they are looking at the tail end to become I4. Uh, the property, as you can see here, is the corner lot on the corner of West Market um, and Leisure. Most of the lot is in that red B4. The rest of the property, all one parcel or, or will be uh, one parcel, uh, is I1, which is industrial, light industrial. Uh, with that being said, this is the site plan that's being go, uh, put forth, which is a car, um, car wash. Uh, you can see the uh, West Market to the South Leisure going north and south on the west side of it. Again, it's in compatible use with an I-1 district, but is compatible with B-4. <coughs> Current land use map shows that the property should be uh, or shall be commercial, should you also choose and does support this request. Neighborhood meeting was attended or was held on December 6th at 531 in attendance. Questions regarding potential future development. Staff does recommend approval, does uh, line up with two objectives of the bridge plan. And oh, my mouse is messing up. Uh, this is the property in question. I, I thought I had a little thread. But anyways, the property, obviously, you have West Market going left to right and through, that, through the center of the screen with leisure going to the north. Um, and obviously, the property is highlighted with the blue arrow. And these are three conditions. This is a public hearing. I'm available for any questions, should you have any. Any questions? All right, thank you. Yes, sir. And I will now open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to comment? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and any motions? Move approval. I have second. a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Trivet. <clears throat> Commissioner Brock? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Vice Mayor Murphy? Yes. Mayor Fowler? Yes. This is the last order of business. That was. Right. That was the last <laughs> order of business. All Thank right. you. That was the last. So before we leave, I will open the comments. Uh, Commissioner Wise. I have nothing. Well, Vice Mayor Murphy. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to share with the commission as well as the public here, we had a phenomenal MLK Unity program and walk. We had our very own uh, men's basketball coach from ETSU, Desmond Oliver, along with Commissioner Hunter and uh, Dr. Keith Johnson from ETSU and Coach uh, Rich Aubrey from Milligan head up the MLK walk. It was a time of unity, a uh, time of peace and harmony. Uh, you missed it please do check out the videos and pictures that were taken and look out for next year um, during the program we had our very own uh, mayor Todd Fowler did a wonderful job along with Commissioner Jenny Brock um, TR Dunn uh, Dr. Daryl Carter 
and uh, Mr. Uh, Adam Dixon. Um, we had a great turnout. Um, I'd like to thank the city staff, Keisha and JT, and all support staff, along with the police officers um, and the Carver staff. It was a great event. So uh, again, if you missed out, check out the pictures and videos and look out for it next year. Thank you all. Commissioner Brown. I, I just, um, um, Mrs. Ball, I, I wanna really thank um, our employees during the holiday time. You know, um, we all just enjoyed and, and celebrated and did all these kind of things, but our employees worked so hard. Um, I particularly want to um, thank our, our public works who put up all the Christmas trees, put the lights on them, and then took them down. <laughs> so that's a big, big piece of work, and I know how much our uh, citizens enjoyed that. Uh, I saw some data from the CVB meeting yesterday, and they, uh, through some um, analytic works that they do, there were about 35,000 visitors who came through uh, Founders Park looking at the trees in King Commons. And a big part of those were from out of town as, long, as well as our own citizens. So uh, it's some interesting data and I'll have them send it over so we can look at it a little bit uh, more in depth. But anyway, thank you to all the employees for their extra time that they work during the holidays. Commissioner Hunter. Uh, just report on the boards that I've met with uh, this week. Uh, as you all are aware, the chamber installed a new president or chair, I guess, uh, for the year. Um, and um, of course, you heard everything that Mr. Cantler had to say today. Um, the library board met, and our newest member that we appointed was in attendance. And so I'm sure all of y'all will start seeing new faces at your committees that you serve on and just welcome them and be excited. And new books in the library, too? New books and new uh, e books. And uh, they're actually up, uh, they're, the readership is back up above pre-COVID numbers and uh, it's just going good. Why would COVID have impacted reading? Uh, close well, to the books come were in fine. The you could check the books out remotely. They had a drive through. Yeah. Yeah, well, they had Every the uh, pickup thing, but right. yeah, e-books did fine, but okay. hard, hard copies. Uh, just didn't good. know, like, were they going to catch it from the books? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Well, I too want to commend Public Works. They may have put the trees up more than one time with the wind, wind. the 50 yeah, mile per did, hour yeah. storm we had. Yeah. They had to put a few of those back up again. So we do appreciate all the city services that went on during the minus 14 wind chill and the 50 mile per hour winds. We've had quite a lot of different storm things over the last few weeks. So thanks. Thanks for all their work. Unless we forget water and sewer. Yes. When it's six degrees outside, we're grateful for water and sewer that works. So thanks to them as well. Yeah. If there's nothing further, I will close our meeting.